Hi there, it's John from Adventure Shetland here. Um, thank you for joining me in part two of our Spooky Shetland series where we are delving into Shetland's history, folklore and traditions. In part one we looked at the trows, which are arguably the most famous creatures from, from these traditions. Um, and if you haven't seen that, it's linked down in the description down below here um, if you want to go and check it out. Today in part two we'll be looking at some of the perhaps lesser known but no less fascinating creatures from the folklore of these islands. So let's dig in and take a look. So we'll kick off today with the feared creature known as the Nyuggle. That's a great fun word to say, but the, the Nyuggle is a, a water horse, um, similar to the Scottish Kelpie. Um, it's usually described as being a black horse. Um, often it's wet and uh, some descriptions of it have it as though the hair is growing backwards in the opposite direction to what it would on a, a regular horse. Um, also its tail is unusually long and it's said that the Nyuggle can kind of spin its tail around um, so that it kind of resembles a wheel. As a type of water horse then Nyuggles tend to be found beside deep pools in burns or up near lochs, um, some of which, such as Nyuggles Water of Scalawa, have been uh, named after the beasts um, as time has gone on. They also have a habit of hanging out at water mills and um, if the users or the owners of the mills didn't placate them with some kind of offering then quite often they would go in underneath the mill and stop the wheel from turning, which would mean that no work could be done in the mill on that day. Some Nuggles would wait where um, roads pass close to locks or burns and they would appear perfectly docile and wait for um, lonely and weary travellers to kind of happen across them along the road. And as I say, they'd, they'd appear tame, friendly and inviting and invariably these travellers would get up onto the back of the horse to kind of make their tra make their journey a little bit easier and they would then invariably find themselves stuck to the horse as it careered at a rate of knots towards the towards the water source. It's unclear if many people were actually drowned by nyuggles or not. Um, it's really not known. It certainly seems that children were particularly uh, taken by them and some adults were as well, but we don't know if, if they were actually drowned or not. Um, what is certain is that these people got a good soaking and um, quite often their clothes would never ever dry um, after. To me, it sounds like a particularly good way of getting your children to avoid going near either strange horses, which may or may not be tame, um, and also uh, to keep them away from sort of uh, bogs and lochs and the deep pools in the burns where they could fall in and drown or get stuck or uh, in other ways harm themselves. Um, it does sound like a very good way of preventing that from happening. A famous Nyuggle story is that of Shoppelty, uh, the Nyuggle from Tangwick near Haishness. And Shoppelty is well known for um, basically disrupting the work at the water mill there. Um, the mill has recently been restored in the last few years. Um, but yeah, late one winter's night, um, a crofter from the area was in the mill grinding his grain. And when he came out, when he was finished, um, it was quite late at night, the moon was high in the sky. And uh, as he kind of walked out of the mill, he noticed a small black horse standing beside the wall. and. Being an older guy, he had a, a full kishi of, of meal that he'd been, he'd been grinding and he thought, this horse seems very friendly, I will use it to, uh, to lighten my burden on the way home. So he, uh, he got onto the back of the horse and loaded his, his kishi on with him and uh, all was going well. They were kind of making their way uh, towards his house, but eventually um, the horse seemed reluctant to, to go up the track to the house and instead it veered off the track and made a beeline for the cliffs, at which point the man realised that this was Shoppelty that he was on and without 
brief, brief moment to spare, he managed to fling himself and his kishi off of the horse just before it careered over the cliffs into um, a hole, a gap in the rocks, which is known to this day as Shoppelty's Hole. And uh, as the horse disappeared over the cliffs, it kind of went over in a, a lick of blue flame. So that, that confirmed his suspicions and, and he knew that it was definitely this, this mystical water horse. A brig day was a fearsome sea monster which um, was known to cruise around the oceans surrounding the isles. Um, it was a long slender beast with a row of terrifying spines along its back and it also had a huge gaping mouth which was said to be able to swallow up whole boats in one mouthful. Nowadays, this creature is known to be a Baskin shark, um, but Brigde is the name that has been given to it in the Shetland dialect after originally being the name for, for the sea monster um, that resembled it. Um, fishermen back in the day, perhaps still are, um, a superstitious bunch, and uh, it's quite easy to see how stories of strange creatures like a Baskin shark could be exaggerated into this terrifying monster particularly in the days before uh, modern science or before much was really known about them um, and how, how docile they actually are. Um, they do look kind of mighty and impressive and, and fearsome, um, especially if it's something that you've never come across before. Interestingly, a number of Baskin sharks, or Brigdies as I've said, um, have been seen around uh, Shetland waters and Shetland shores in 2020 um, throughout the later part of the summer. Um, such as the one you've seen here, which was filmed by Ryan Lee. Probably the best known creatures we'll discuss today, the seal folk or the selkies, um, are well known in uh, folklore from Shetland, Orkney and beyond. As a rule, they're not particularly scary or spooky in any way, but uh, they are a sea creature from our folklore and that means that they're, they're worthy of, of mentioning today. So the Selkies could remove their seal skin and then could move around on land in human form and they were often known to gather on beaches where they would sing and dance around together. But if they were disturbed by a person they could easily grab their, their seal skins again, put them back on and plunge back into the sea. So there are loads of versions of a story where uh, a selkie has left their skin too far away and it's usually a woman uh, or a, a selkie wife who's done that and uh, the skin is always, almost always, stolen by a man um, and, uh, and she can't return to the sea. Generally what tends to happen in these stories is uh, they end up getting married the, the human man with uh, the seal skin and the selkie wife. And they tend to uh, live happily together, um, have a successful marriage um, and raise a family all in, uh, yeah, all, all in, in happiness. But eventually, after a while, usually um, it happens to be one of the children who is um, playing around and finds this mysterious bag um, either out in the byre or in the loft or um, behind some loose stones in a wall depending on uh, the different versions of these stories. Um, the kid which has found this bag is kind of a bit confused as to what it is and so takes it to their mother to show them. Um, she looks inside and realises that it's her seal skin that the child has found. And they tend to live in, um, in a state of kind of inner and emotional conflict for a little while um, as they try and decide what to what to do but almost always um, the silky wife finds the the draw of the sea and their their previous life too strong and they uh, they take the seal skin put it on and return to the waves never to be seen again the fins are a mysterious and powerful being from Shetland's folklore. Uh, they seem to have been a race of humans, although they had the power to shapeshift 
and they would often take on the form of fish or birds or seals, um, depending on what they needed to do. And they could also make themselves visible or invisible at will. In many aspects, they seem quite similar to the Sami Shaman, although they also had the power to control the weather and they could raise storms and rough seas or quell them and make everything calm, more or less on a whim or as they saw fit. They had also the ability to travel extremely far and very quickly. Um, for example, they would be able to row between Shetland and Norway and back again in a single night, which is a distance of around 200 miles in each direction, depending on whereabouts in Norway they were heading to. And they also seem to have had the ability to tell of events in far off lands in more or less real time. It's also said that in human form, they would regularly appear as being um, wealthy or at least well-dressed gentlemen and they often had a habit of making bets or bargains with people. There are a lot of Finn place names in Shetland. Um, Fettler has Finny and Finnigat. Uh, Delton has a place called Finister now and then Neston there are the Finister hats as well. Um, which are all places um, either associated with or where the Finns are said to have lived um, and many of them have archaeological remains there as well. Finnegart in Fettler has a particularly interesting story attached to it and it is said that the crofter there was trying to build a faily dick or a turf wall around his yard but he wasn't having very much success with it um, and the sheep were still getting in and chomping away on his crops which he wasn't too happy about. Um, but that night he went to his bed, fell asleep and a Finn appeared to him in a dream and said Thy folk were good to whiz so we'll be good to thee in turn. And when he awoke the next morning he found that his yard was surrounded by a really good high stone wall and from that day to this, um, the croft is known as Finnegan, which means the Finn's enclosure. So we'll finish up today with a few other creatures who are probably less well known, even than the ones that we've, uh, we've just been discussing uh, so far. But uh, they're no less interesting. They're all scary or spooky or just plain weird. Uh, and for that reason I've decided to include them in this video. Um, all of these may relate to just one individual creature rather than a species or a race like the ones we've mentioned before as well. So let's go into them. So first up in this category we have a creature called the Marul. Um, it's said to have the head of a fish but with a crest of flickering flames and the head is covered entirely in eyes. Um, it's described as being a very malignant creature and apparently you can hear it shouting and singing whenever a ship sinks. Up next we have another water horse, although this one is a very different type of character to the Nyogle. Tangy is a seahorse, not that kind and uh, is often seen riding along the waves, agitating them to fury, which I think is a fantastic description. Tangy desperately desires a human wife and uh, often he will rush up the beach on a wave to uh, try and snatch away an unwary girl to take with him back to his watery lair. Unsurprisingly for a water horse, Tangy is horse-shaped and he has a rampant snow white mane and icy blue eyes. Um, he's also had said to have a, kind of a curly white or cream uh, coat, um, identical in, in colour and texture to seafoam. Uh, he's mostly seen around uh, rocky shores and skerries, but uh, sometimes he will appear in other places as well. 
Finally, we have the Wolver, who was uh, like a man, but with the head of a wolf, and was covered in short brown hair. Um, apparently, he lived up on a hillside in a in a cave on a yeah, on a steep slope, and uh, apparently he liked to fish, um, which he would do from a small stone out in the deep water, which is still known as the Wolver Stain. Um, he kind of had a, a live and let live sort of attitude. Um, basically, if people left him alone, he would leave them alone. But he did have a benevolent side as well. And he would often leave gifts of fish on the windowsills of poor and starving families and people, um, as well as those who were sick. And uh, sometimes he would be seen sitting mournfully outside the homes of people who were terminally ill. Wolver's Hool in Unst has been named after this creature or this individual and um, the name translates to Hill of the Wolver. Um, so it's very possible that this is actually where he lived or uh, near to where he used to live. So there we have it for part two of the Spooky Shetland series. Now we've learned about a whole host of creatures and beings from Shetland's folklore. Don't forget to like and share this video wherever you can um, and if you feel like it you can subscribe to the Adventure Shetland YouTube channel just down there, push that button and uh, if you ring the bell beside it then that will turn your notifications on and you'll never miss another video in this series and beyond. As always I would love to know your thoughts on, uh, on what we've spoken about today um, so if you have something to say please leave me a comment down below. And if you want to follow along with what we're up to on a day-to-day -day basis, then uh, you can find all of our social media links um, in the description, which again is down there. Um, if you would like to chuck some money my way to support me through the winter as we head into it now, um, you can do so. Um, I've included the links to the merchandise and the virtual tours, um, again in the description below. And any money that you do spend there goes directly into supporting me and the company and it's all very greatly appreciated. That's all for our today. I'm John from Adventure Shetland. Thank you for watching and I will catch you again soon for more spooky Shetland adventures. Cheers!